Welcome to the Black Entrepreneur Experience Podcast, inside the business, buzz, and brilliance of Black entrepreneurs. Here is your host, Dr. Francis Richards. What happens in Vegas goes all over the world on Black Entrepreneur Experience, episode number 409. Thank you for joining us as we elevate the Black Entrepreneur Experience by interviewing CEOs, thought leaders, innovative thinkers, and Black entrepreneurs across the globe. I'm your host, Dr. Francis Richards. Are you an emerging brand that would like to grow and scale faster? Our next guest is an award-winning growth strategist, top 100 marketing podcaster, author, investor, founder, and keynote speaker. Welcome, Troy Sandrit. Thank you for having me. I'm so happy to be here. You're welcome. I've given our audience such a brief bio. Why don't you fill in the gaps and share with our audience what you'd like them to know about you and your business? So as someone from Chicago, from the area, and having to, as we say, get it out of the mud, I'm a living proof that if you learn how to just stay the course, learn how to network, you know, you may not have the direct lines, you may not have the funds or the investors, all the connections, but you can still carve out a good path for for you if you stick to the plan. I say that to say that I had everything in the world against me <laughs> from from the day I was born, uh, no, no cap, to try to pursue what I was now born to do. I was three months premature, born two pounds, two ounces. And so I'm coming out of the womb fighting for my life, right? And then I had to have immediate surgery three days after that. And then fast forward, I lost my birth mother uh, at eight years old. And, you know, you navigate that as a black man trying to do something of themselves. And, you know, you're coming from a very strong blue collar family. My family, very religious, very sound. But at the time, I'm at a crossroads where we're seeing new technologies. The world that we know it now wasn't the world 20 years ago. And what we know as social media and marketing as of now wasn't even the same case five or 10 years ago. And so as a young Black entrepreneur pursuing a space, many of us aren't there that I can even lean on and having to still find my path, but that's still true to myself, my essence, my voice took some time. But I think I'm so grateful to be here in this moment because I can expound on that, but also just express that we can keep our integrity. We can do it in a way that feels right to us and still be successful, still make an impact, as long as you create a growth plan that aligns for all of those things. You dropped some huge value bombs there. How did you find your path? Not to be religious, but a lot of prayer. If you're not religious, meditation, whatever you need to keep yourself mentally sane. I think you have to be comfortable with adapting to uncomfortability. I like to say adapt, which means always do all possible things. I think a lot of people can give you motivation, inspiration, and quotes, but there's always a negative. When I say adapt, no matter what happens, I'm always going to do what's possible in this moment. And when I keep that headspace, that keeps me humble, that keeps me driven, and that gives me a good, healthy perspective to not get too complacent, but still you're content at the same time. And so I always apply that kind of methodology to things because as there's one season that you're growing and there's another season that things are slowing down. And I think people are too reactive and they're not proactive. When you're proactive as an entrepreneur, I'm already knowing there's going to be seasons where I may not be financially stable. So that means when I'm having an abundance, I put money away. I put things away. I connect, I network. I don't drop the ball when it comes to conversations to my community because when I'm down, those are the very people that's going to keep me moving forward, keep me stable in those seasons. And so, especially for us Black entrepreneurs, it's imperative that we be proactive. It's imperative that we plan ahead and not the moment we get a big payday or big new clients or the idea of what is. I don't make a move. I don't make a move right now until something is signed and it hits my account. Because as a black entrepreneur, I have made moves in my past off the impression that this person, this client, this partnership was going to go through, not realizing they backed out. I'm cut with an expense I can't afford. 
I'm cut with things I can't do. Or the worst thing that kind of scrubs our ego, we post all about it on social media, what we got. And then we got to come back later like, I didn't get it. Something didn't happen. And then we just feel some type of way. I thought you were an entrepreneur. I thought you were this and that. And so when you learn how to plan and be proactive and move in silence and knowing I won't post on social till I got it in the bag until it's done, then that gives you a lot of breathing room to cut out all the noise to focus on what your business was meant to do in the first place. How did you raise capital to start your business? Thankfully for me, I bootstrapped. And then two, I'm very good at moving in a very lean way. I think people think they need to have a, a massive surplus to launch their business. Now, keep in mind, legally, there is some nuances depending on what type of business you're doing and everything else, of course. But for what I'm doing, and for, for full disclosure, I am a consultant. I'm a growth advisor, a growth strategist. Really, it's my brain. It's my ability. It's my perspective. It's what's being sold as a service. So SaaS, sold as a service, strategy as a service is kind of my area of genius. And so knowing that my cost to maintain and launch my business wasn't a lot of money. And then also I've learned in many cases, closed mouths don't get fed. I think we feel as maybe Black entrepreneurs, we have this since because maybe most of us are coming from a nine to five, we have this sense of we have to be in a certain way to get anything versus, oh, no, I have to re remove myself from this nine to five mentality. And as a business owner, own that I'm a business owner and make the ask. So whatever I need, I can build connections. And I'm sure either someone's going to give me the advice or we're going to barter in exchange for what we're trying to do. So my capital was pretty low. I didn't really need to do any loans or anything like that. And my goal was, if I can't make any profit in the first 30 to 90 days of me doing this, then that tells me this isn't worth me pursuing, even if I were to try to get more capital. If you lost everything and you had to rebuild in 30 days, what industry and why? Tech industry, for sure, because you have people who need to integrate and update. So there's a massive audience there in which you can get by high volume. And on the flip side, if you're on the cutting edge of technology, that means you're indisposable to new technologies that your competitors probably still haven't done. Plus, they have a lot of disposable income. So that way, at the very least, if we need to find grand, 25 grand, things like that, whether directly or in a multitude of things, they probably could write that off and get it to you much faster than other industries could. I want you to have a monologue. I want you to name this person, living or not. They've inspired you so much. What are you saying, Troy, to that person? And who is that person? This person saw a young Black man, high ambition, high zeal, not enough discipline, but was bitter because they never got a chance to lead. And they knew all I needed was a chance. This person gave me this opportunity, but also in the mannerism of how they did it, forced me to earn it. They had all the power in the world to make the path easy for me. And I didn't understand at the time as to why they did it the way that they did. I had to prove myself amongst my peers. I was the youngest in the room. I was the only black in the room. And I was pushing a new direction that they never did before. So all the pressure's on me. But during that period of time, I earned their trust and respect. I found my voice. I proved I could make them money in the way that I did things, but I also learned how to lead up and win through controversy, or I would say in the midst of controversy. This person was a CEO of an organization who gave me my first opportunity out of college. I was moving, I was a former electrical engineer, and I had the opportunity between Boeing and this other company. Boeing and this other company, a company None of mine in my family has, own, has known. And again, keep in mind, my family is a blue collar and we're looking through things. We only know what the information that we had. And so this person convinced me this is the right path. I chose this company over Boeing. And for the next three and a half years, I was the first person in my family to travel, not only in the continent of the United States, outside of my home state of Indiana and out of Chicago, Illinois, but also internationally as well to see different cultures different experiences, 
and lead an international team, all while finding my voice of what I wanted to do. And as someone who's come from nothing, and for the most part of his life, early part of life, lived in a certain block areas I all to know, it was eye-opening. It changed my life, and it put me on the path to where I am today. And so that person uh, was Joe Rocco, and he was the CEO of an organization I used to work for. I'm very grateful for him giving me that opportunity that really propelled me to where I am now. And talk about your day quit and how you went full time into your business. I think proper preparation prevents poor performance, and I can't stress that enough. You definitely want to have more than enough income to compensate for at least six months of runway. And also be mindful that just adjusting your mindset to, I'm not working a nine to five to provide, I'm working a nine to five to fund my business. And so I went through a transition of shifting my mindset of how I look at this nine to five to now employ and fund my business. Your nine to five, depending on what you're doing, could be a, a purge for your con connections, clientele, and things like that. And so I definitely use the resources from there to start establishing my network. I focused on building my personal brand that helped the company, but also helped myself in my own company. And so that period of time was probably a good three years, the long game than for some people. And sure, you, you can get frustrated. Even if I had money saved up, wisdom will tell you, don't make any hasty moves. And so I want to make sure I had good stability. I had good clients. I had a good position in the market. I knew exactly what I was doing. And I had six months worth of runaway to make sure if anything happens, myself and my family were good. And as an entrepreneur, it's not just about us. These decisions impact more than just us. And so that three-year period was a good time for me as an incubator to adjust and modify accordingly. What do you need right now that you don't have to move the needle forward? I think right now what I would need the most is time. Time is the most expensive, priceless commodity that you have. And as entrepreneurs, we forget that. We exchange time for money through our nine to fives, and we may take that over to our entrepreneurship journey. But at a certain point, if you want to scale your business, you actually need to buy yourself more time, which means investing in delegations of people and processes and technologies, giving yourself the headspace. We can't run, gun 14, 20 hours. Sometimes we need three days of headspace to make a very strategic, calculated move that can actually boost your profitability in no time. And so my challenge has been, as of recently, is time. I have grown my business to where I'm in a lot of things. My clients are doing well. I am blessed to say that I am doing well. And to get to that next step, I need to reduce the amount of load that I'm doing for my day-to-day -day so I can tr make strategically make the right moves to expand kind of where I'm going. Someone's listening, Troy, and they said, gosh, Troy said I'm doing well. How do you define well? Well is subjective. For the listeners, I want you to keep that in mind. When I say I'm doing well, it doesn't mean I'm doing great in my mind. I have a North Star that I'm chasing, and people on the outside may say, I just settle for what he's got. And in my mind, I'm not even close to where I want to go. And so we have to consider when we're saying we're doing well, your mountain of success may be different than my definition of mountain of success. And it may look different. It may say, seem different but it's your journey and it may have the same amount of energy that it costs to get there because we're both pushing ourselves to the next level. So when I say I'm doing well, I'm saying I'm not struggling. I have a good understanding of where I am financially. I have a good bearings of where I am mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. And I feel really sound and calm in my moves right now when I'm defining when I'm saying I'm doing well. What I would like to say and add to that is that what I define as being great is that I am moving forward in this next phase that I want, and I'm seeing it clear. There's no haze, and I'm getting at least a few brownie points of direction that it's going to work while maintaining what I already have. My goal is I should not have to exert more of my time and energy to grow because that means if that's the case, it's too heavy bearing on myself to maintain. 
But if I can maintain what I have and still grow with less energy of Troy and more energy of exerting to other teams, collaboration and partnerships, that keeps me st st very stable. And that means I'm doing great. There are so many brands and businesses that are dominating. Talk about a brand or a business that's dominating that you admire and why. I think the e I'll give it two answers. The easy answer, I think, would be the people at OpenAI, ChatGPT. The reason why I admire is that most people are now being familiar with them. They've been working at this for four plus years. And ironically enough, what people are now loving and using at a massive rate, you know, they boost their valuation to billion plus dollars now, was an afterthought project to do one thing. And then once the world got a hold of it, oh no. This is the thing that people want to use to do everything. And I say that to say for especially us black entrepreneurs that, you know, y'all be watching TV and you have an idea. And you're like, man, I thought of that. You know, you might have thought of that, but you didn't act on it because you thought eh, it's a small project. No one's going to care. If you if I dared you to put that to market, the market is going to tell you what the value is. of. And keep in mind, we have a tendency to lean in on our our community, our church, our family, but they're not business folks. They're not the folks who want to buy and give this evaluation or investors. So if we put our stuff to market and see what out there, let the market tell you. You might be surprised what your air quote little project is. might be very valuable. The other group I'm looking at that to me is very inspiring right now is the New York Times. What? Print? What? This is not going to do with anything. I looked at them over the pandemic and everyone said print was dead. And rightfully so, I can understand some sentiment of that. We deal with five generations, and only three of them are even used to getting newspapers or remember getting newspapers to the front door. However, they have positioned and shifted their business model. They still have kept their namesake, and it still matters. Content that still comes out of that business still matters. And so what am I saying from that? There are many businesses who were super successful before this pandemic. And now they're at a crossroads where Everything that I did to get here is not working. That doesn't mean your business is over. That doesn't mean you can't rekindle the flame or the fire that you had from a brand positioning. It's about pivoting and shifting to match what the market demands and reverse engineer it back to what you provide as a business. And if you can do that, you can still thrive in this new environment that we're dealing with right now. What is your ideal client? That's a phenomenal question. And I feel like every other day it changes. <laughs> but I would say an ideal client of mine is one that 100% will not flinch at my price. I say that because many Black entrepreneurs tend to devalue our price because we see we turned down an opportunity that was lower and we're worried about what's the next one. But when we look at it from a financial perspective, it's not about how many I have. It's about does this outcome match the output? So if I have three clients that pay me exactly what I want for the month, I ain't worried about the 10 that I didn't take on. And so that's coming from a mindset of scarcity. And we want to come from a mindset of abundance. And so for me, the client has to be able to not flinch at my price. I'm not lowering my price. I'm not discounting my price. I'm not even going to give you the cash flow window to stretch it out unless it strategically makes the right sense for me by case by case basis. I say that as the first answer to this question, because Troy, over the years, I'm a very passionate person. And most Black entrepreneurs, we're passionate, we care, we want to make an impact. We're driven by that to our core. And what happens? They tell us our story. They tell you their story, what they're trying to do. And we, our heart tingles and we just want to help. And we help. And then slowly we don't get paid. Or we don't get paid what we want. And little behold, they get what they need and they're gone. And now we're out thousands of thousands of dollars. We're out all this money that we now have to recap that we put our own money into. So to protect ourselves, rule number one, if you can't pay my price and I flinch at it, we ain't doing business. I don't care what it is because I got to take care of myself first. I can't help you if I can take care of me. Number two, now that we know that they can financially afford me, do they align with my stylistic approach? Or are they trying to put me in a box? We have to have wisdom and we have to be aware that why are you choosing me? Why are you choosing me? Are you choosing me because you need to have a quota of black business, which is fine. Whatever it is, sometimes we need the money. But I just need to understand psychologically, why are you choosing me? And will you 
believe and use my product or service the intentional way it was meant to do. I like to think of my business like a lawyer. I want to make sure I can get a high win rate because you ain't messing with my brand reputation because you're saying my services didn't work for you or my products, my skincare products, my clothes wasn't the right stuff for your event. Oh, no, honey. I need to make sure I'm going to have a good win rate. And so financially, they can afford me. Two, they align with what I do and see the vision. And three, are they going to be fun to work with? I find I should not have to feel any type of way. I want to have fun. What I do is my zone of genius. I'm good at it, but I want to have fun with my clients. And so those are my three things. Financially sound, make sure that they align with our, my direction or my product or my service, and we're going to have fun. That's my three components of my ideal client. Talk about mental wellness and entrepreneurship. Ooh, this is very critical for any successful Black entrepreneur. Because unlike many counterpart entrepreneurs from different ethnicities and races, if I can be very open, Frank, we still have a community where when people are going against the grain and pursuing entrepreneurship, even in this day and age, it still seems foreign. It almost seems impossible. And most people can't wrap their head around your vision of what you're trying to do. The other part of that is many still live in fear. They're traumatized. And so they project their fear and traumatization on your vision of what you're trying to do as an entrepreneur, which means there's friction. And friction begets negativity, and negativity begets weight. And as you take on too much weight because you're taking on too much noise because we want our community to approve of our positioning, that creates mental health issues. That keeps us stressed because as a people, we are designed by years and years and years of generations to be a community that moves in sync. And entrepreneurship is pulling us out of this sink that most are still in nine to fives and they're not doing the things that we're doing. We have a lack of education. We have a lack of funds. All these different variables out of their control influences their direction to how they see you in your pursuit of your entrepreneurship journey. And that's a big toll that a lot of entrepreneurs, specifically Black entrepreneurs, don't talk enough about. We are unicorns. We, there aren't that many of us. It takes a different type of exercise and mental well-being to break, surpass that. And so that's alignment with your faith if you're religious, that's aligned with meditation, that's aligned with finding the people in your circle that are going to be your net as you're trying to find your way, and even after you find your way, to keep you going. Most businesses fail. 70% of businesses and 88% of Black businesses fail within the first year. Not because their idea was bad. It's because they had a combination of lack of funding and they burnt out because they didn't have the right infrastructure in place to help them maintain. So if you are the cog in the wheel, one of your biggest priorities should be your own mental health and well-being. It is making sure that you eat well, that you exercise, that you get some air, get some headspace, you get some sunlight, and you structure your business that allows you the freedom to get rest. It's easy early on to bank on I can exert eight more hours on top of what I do for my nine to five, but that's going to catch up with you. We can't run like a machine forever. That being said, we have to consider our perspective within amongst our community. We have to take care of our well-being. And sometimes it means to retreat ourselves from our community to have more headspace to focus on the very things we need to do during that time period to actually grow. You can't have both at the same time. We have to understand that if you don't, you're going to feel the taxation of being tired, of being frustrated and stressed, and that will cloud your emotional EQ to see and forget your goal and give up. And I would rather you retreat yourself, build your structure, build the sustainability to do what you were born to do unequivocally than to invite everyone into their, their headspace and influence your mental health and you actually just achieve what you want to do. Because I'll say this, one person told me that, and it stuck with me to this very day. They said, how dare you not do what you were meant to do out of fear or because you didn't prepare yourself? If someone didn't do what they did, we wouldn't have the cure for this. 
we wouldn't have this technology. We wouldn't have the very things that we now have adapted to our livelihood because someone chose to go out on the path, prepare themselves, and do what they do accordingly. And that is directly tied to our mental health and well-being. What does self-care look like for Troy? Self-care for Troy is always a work in progress. I'm a recovering workaholic. I'll be very transparent. But I'm learning. I'm learning my chronotype. My chronotype, I'm a night owl. And so most times coming through a nine to five, I felt really bad about not being my most productive self really early in the morning. But once I learned my chronotype, I rearranged my whole entire work schedule and many things in my life to fit the type of day where Troy is the most active and at his best self. Now, that took me a long time to figure out. I didn't know a lot of the stuff that I'm saying to you right now. I was very ignorant in a lot of things. So that would be a big part of it. The other part is understanding we've adapted a lot of bad habits that many people in our family or our community consolidate because they themselves are not trying to do what we're trying to do. But when you're different, and you are different if you're an entrepreneur, you have to eat different. Let's just be honest. You got to eat different. You have to exercise. You have to treat your body like you're a machine. I have to give all my, my body all the different things that it needs, rest, sleep, exercise, even vacations and breaks to maximize my productivity so I can achieve my goals. And for me, I found a good way to approach adapting and modifying yourself is to do two things differently for 30 days. Not that you're going to do it exactly right every day, but the fact that you had the intention every day you woke up, I know I need to do these two things. Even if you didn't do them, you held yourself accountable that I'm going to try again tomorrow. And I find that being, it doesn't matter the what, it's all about the outcome and the actual change. Because once you can see yourself changing It's easier to adapt to do more changes to not only better your life, but the likelihood that you can make your business successful. Who are your top two mentors or influencers and what lessons do they teach you? I have a lady out of uh, California. Her name was Shauna. She was my first female coach, though I would consider her more of a a life strategist. I don't like the word coach because it's too subjective and people can tie it a million different ways and it has its own connotations. What I love about what she was able to do with me, it wasn't about, if I could be blunt, a lot of men have this way of um, just will yourself and not be included with your emotions. And she told me to get yourself ahead. You actually have to deal with your past and your trauma and your emotions in a very specific way to for you to be okay with who you are, whether you suffer from imposter syndrome or you're neurodivergent or you struggle with insecurities, dealing with a lot of that comes from just survivalist instincts from your past. And so she helped me deal with a lot of things that I've dealt with and confront them. I am a certain way because I don't, I want to help the world because I've had seasons where I felt abandoned. And so my counteractive response to that was to help, 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 help. The problem with that from a business perspective, that means, like I said earlier, I'm helping, I'm not getting paid money. I'm helping, but at my detriment, from the core root that I don't want anyone to feel how I felt. And that's not the case, but that's something I adopted. And so she's helped me deal with a lot of these past things to understand why Troy does what he does. So now I have a better chance at changing these things to build better habits so I, as a business, can thrive and flourish. The other mentor that I really respect, um, his name is Gary Nix, and he was literally the first Black man I came to know in my space doing what I was doing. There wasn't many of us, (laughs) nor did I know many of people who had logos and worked with bigger brands, And the way he carried himself as a business professional was something I admired. We as Black entrepreneurs typically feel like we have a chip on our shoulders with something to prove. But when you feel like you've already been there and you come into the room like, 
I already know what I'm doing. I know my value. I have nothing to prove to nobody. If you want to work with me, if you want to choose me, you will do so on your own free will. And there was something out he carried himself. Troy, what is our biggest takeaway from our conversation today? What do you want the audience to leave with? I think the first thing is to give yourself some grace. Be thankful that you have an idea that can actually be converted into money. Not many people are blessed with that talent or ability. And just be in the moment, understanding that the vision that you are, that you have is yours. It's meant for you to see it through. No one else. I think the other thing is to consider we're all on our own path and journey. And while I'm giving my own thoughts from my perspective, whether my struggles, but also my success, you have to quantify that to align with your own journey of what you determine as success and where you're trying to come from. I think the other thing to take away and think about is that there is always a way if you adapt, always do all possible things to move things forward. But also understanding when you're coming into business, you must think like a business person, not a nine to five or as a side gig. You want to be able to commit. Commitment doesn't mean you have to immediately stop everything you're doing to put yourself in an unfortunate financial situation because of your passion. Passion only gets you so far. It must be in its proper place. You must have things in order so you can be sustainable in order to scale and see it through. Every condition is different when it comes to business, but especially as Black entrepreneurs, we have to be double as cautious, but also double as driven. We can't hold ourselves back out of pride. We have to remember, ask for help when we need to, have our self-mental health boundaries, physical boundaries, business boundaries. We can't tell everyone all of our business, but also be mindful that we can't scale without a community that understands us, that hears us, and can be an advocate for us. Not everyone who knew from you back in the day should be your business partner or one to evaluate if your business is going to be successful. If you want to make real money, you have to go where the money is. And, you know, sometimes as Black businesses, as someone who has done it himself, we must go to places where we may feel uncomfortable and we're among the few and the, with the intent, hear me out, hear me now, with the intent that when we do get to the other side, we create a bigger opening to help those behind us have an easier path in their entrepreneurship journey as well. We know that entrepreneurship is about risk and rewards. Talk about your worst moment in business or your most costly mistake. And what was your takeaway? Well, there are so many to count. <laughs> I wouldn't even know where to begin. One big example that comes to mind, I got so caught up in the idea of working with this client, with these group of individuals, and thought this was going to be put me on the map and didn't do my due diligence and what my contract said. Sometimes we jump on an opportunity because we see their network, their valuation is so humongous, is gonna, we're going to win by association. And that's great in theory, but when it comes to business, without a contract, without legal counsel, without things signed and expressed very clarified, you can be cut out of significantly in deals. This particular instance, I helped grow a business to about... $3.2 million in a year. I was still early on in my entrepreneurship journey. I still didn't have the confidence in myself to even deem the amount of money I wanted to charge. So I charged much less. So I worked and worked and worked with under the intent that they're going to pay me, that they're going to see the amount of money that I make them. They're going to give me equity. It's going to be all these great things. At the end of that period, they got what they needed. They grew. And I got a gift card for $500. And I got a stipend for fifteen hundred. They made three point two million, and the valuation went up to twenty seven point six million, and they're still successful and in business today. Now, some people will tell you that's just business. No, that's just me at that time being ignorant and not holding people accountable to an actual contract. So the thought is to make sure you evaluate your ability, but also what I should have done that I do now moving forward in those situations is. This is my value, what I'm going to do, but I'm also going to tie in a percentage to what my efforts residually perform for you down the road 
So that way I can get residuals as well because you're still surviving and thriving off of my hard work in the infantry, in the infancy phase, uh, phases. And so that was a big mistake I did just to not consider the contracts. And I find even that's a one example, but there's many examples where I've taken on client work and didn't have a contract signed or the contract didn't cover certain nuances. You know, we've all done, we've done more work than we should have for the money. We didn't have boundaries. And then somehow you blink and this feels like a nine to five job when they're supposed to be your client. <laughs> no, 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 no. So that was one example. The other example I would say that I've learned and I've definitely made a big pillar for it in is to just make sure my business aligns with my life. We take for granted, I, earlier I've talked about time is the most expensive commodity that you have. We take for granted time. And though we chose to be in business, that doesn't mean your family did and those key relationships in your life. And so make sure as you're pursuing your entrepreneurship journey for the intent of being successful or wealthy or generational wealth or making a bigger impact in the world, that you don't forget the people who are there with you every step of the way, watching you struggle, survive, thrive, and make things come alive. Talk about marriage and entrepreneurship. This is a phenomenal question. And for starters, we Black entrepreneurs don't talk about this enough. <laughs> we don't. We don't talk about it enough. And that is a problem. I would not be who I am, where I am, with what I have without my wife. That is not me saying that out of semantics. That is not me saying it out of formality. That is me saying that because that is the truth. When you're one of the biggest reasons marriage fails, financial instability. And entrepreneurs, you are willingly choosing to take on more risk with the high possibility of being in a massive state of financial instability. So you need someone not only who aligns with your vision, but gives you the grace to fail. He worked there because we're all going to fail. We're going to fail thousands of times, micro times or big times before we hit it big or succeed. And entrepreneurship comes with a certain type of lifestyle. Nine to five in most businesses, you're done. In entrepreneurship, that's almost a second relationship. So you have to balance the two, get clarity. And you know what? I've always, I've learned in my years of entrepreneurship to consult her. She may not know what I know in my mind regarding the, the logistics of my business, but she knows me as a person. And we can be too narrow-minded in our goals. And that significant other can be there to guide you, call you out when you seem too stressed. You seem too deep in the weeds. You need a break. Maybe that's too much or they're not getting enough time. These are the same people that we convince ourselves we're doing everything for, but let's not mess up on the key milestones in that relationship off the intent of trying to grow a business. You can have a successful marriage, a healthy marriage, and a lasting marriage while also having a really good business. You can have your cake and eat it too. It's about figuring out the right process and way to do so. And even if that's communication of, Hey, to your partner, for the next six months, I'm going to be in deep work mode. I may not be going on vacation. We may be, have to be a little more frugal with our spending. But by the end of this, my hope and goal is that we'll double our income or we'll achieve this thing. And so it's just communicating along the way. And that's a big part of a successful marriage and ultimately a successful business. What do you dream about often that you don't have that you would like to do that you want to make happen? I dream to have the ability to travel more. And by my definition of travel, I mean, I don't have to worry about anything. I don't need to pick up a phone call, check an email. The businesses run itself. I'm out for the week. If I don't have the ability to do that, I haven't made it yet. And I would like to just do so whenever I feel like it. And that requires me to have a certain amount of sustainability, sustainable systems and structures in place, delegations, boundaries, capital, all those things set up properly for me to do so. And so that's a big dream of mine, just to travel whenever I feel like it and have the ability to not work every day. Right now, I'm not in grind mode, but I am in that next phase where you're starting to delegate and offset and explore new avenues and test new things and seeing what the next decade is for you. And my hope and my dream 
is that in the next five to 10 years, Trump only has to work one day a week. Everything else runs smooth. Now, we can't phantom that because we're conditioned from nine to five and how things are in our society. But imagine building your business where you are so financially stable and it runs itself. You just show up for appearances. <laughs> you just do these things and you have the a financial backing to do so. I could hire more people. I could invest in more small businesses that need a big break to get their business off the ground. All because I built a place to make that work. And so that's a big dream of mine, both of them. We're going to talk about an attitude of gratitude. And I want you to have what I call a thank fest. And I want you to thank individuals and situations or circumstances that has made you who you are. Have at it. Definitely my mom and dad. My dad for always thinking, allow me to explore whatever I wanted to. And my mother, but not letting it go. If Even if I got a 99%, she's going to ask me, why did I not get 100%? They have built my discipline and my drive. And I owe a lot to them, their wisdom, their understanding, and their support. Even at times when I explored a new avenue that was unbeknownst to them, once they understood what I was doing and saw the impact of what I was doing, they had been my biggest cheerleader, my biggest advocate. My father will listen to every podcast episode, every live stream, every speaking event that I've done, and will give me a full denosle of everything that he heard and what it made sense to him. And Troy, you know, Troy, this should have done it this way and that way. So I'm very grateful for parents like that. I've already echoed about my wife as to in many ways, I wouldn't be who I am or would I be dressed the way that I am without her support. I'm very smart, but I needed some help in my branding and my culture of how I wanted to position myself. And she's always made me very aware of that and how I came across with my process. I'm grateful for situations where I got let go. I got let go of some organizations that I made big money for them, made big impact for them. And they let me go in part because they felt threatened or uh, their ego felt scratched because who was this young black man coming and making an impact? pride myself of being a change agent, coming in and making, doing all these different things and making things happen because I love to make things happen fast so people can see results and get buy-in. And so in times I've learned, you know, there's sometimes it doesn't matter how much you do. If someone doesn't like you for who you are or feel threatened by you, they will do anything they can to let tear you down. But in those moments, I learned to be resilient and I learned that in spite of everything that may happen, whether you get let go from a job or a client cuts you off, preparation prevents performance. They can't change my ability. That doesn't change my skill set. If I, I've met many times where I have lost a job and I couldn't get hired for months because of my brand and my ability, I still got client work. I still made sure all the bills were paid, took care of my wife. We never missed a meal simply because I knew my talent. And so understanding that gives me a little bit sense of calm that despite anything that may happen, because of your talent, you can always rebuild and build it better. The last thing I would say in this moment, I think being in a place that keeps you humble. I look back over the last eight years of my career, and if I really get really micro, the last 18 months, I launched a book. I spoke on some of the biggest stages in my life. I emceed for an, uh, the biggest B2B marketing event that featured Barack, President Barack Obama and Viola Davis, which we met off stage and hugged and I had a whole moment and I cried, but that's another conversation for another day. I did all those things and built an agency and pushed myself in so many different avenues, but all of that came about off the so many years that no one saw me. No one knew who I was. No one knew what was going on. All the live streams that you may see me now was more eloquent in my articulation of my thoughts and my animation was years of practice. And what do I say? How do I answer a question? How do I sound authoritative and get my thoughts together and feel when I hear the recording, that sounds like me. That sounds like me. That takes years. And so I'm grateful for those years because off of those pillars, I am who I am. And those opportunities have led me to see there's so much more we as black entrepreneurs don't even realize we could achieve and do 
because of our limiting beliefs and because we didn't know our abilities and our business could transcribe to so many other areas. And that only comes with time. And so embrace that journey and enjoy the ride and be willing to be as fluid as water and see what happens. You can start off in one industry and make 10 times as much money in a totally different in industry, just simply transferring your ability and work. If you conducted this interview, what is the one question you would have asked yourself? I want you to ask the question and answer it. Are you worthy of the life you want to build through your business? My answer would be yes, but I premise by saying for many years, I never thought I was worthy. I always thought I was lucky. For many years, I thought I made it off the prayers of somebody else, which I probably still do, and I'm blessed. But at some point, you have to know in yourself, you are worthy to be in this moment. You are worthy to be behind this mic. You are worthy to have your name to that business. You are worthy to walk into any room that you are allowed or invited to be in. They invited you in those rooms. They chose to take your Zoom call. They chose to meet you for coffee. They chose to hear you out for funding. So that means you are worthy to be in that space. So act accordingly. People work with people who are confident. People work with people who have clarity. People who work with people who have the ability to know within themselves as an aura about them, I want to work with them. And that comes with knowing that you are worthy to pursue this. And if you get it, you are worthy to possess this wholeheartedly. Money is a utility. So don't fear that more money is going to make you a better or worse person. More money is going to allow me to make impact more of my community. More money is going to allow me to build generational wealth. More money is going to allow me to make a bigger impact across different divisions that I couldn't even imagine. And so that's fear talking. That's insecurity talking. That's generations of oppression talking. That's you being ignorant of not knowing your value and leaning into it. And so that took me some time to figure that out. But once I did, I know I am worthy. That doesn't mean I have it all together. That doesn't mean I have all the money that I want. That don't mean I still don't live paycheck to paycheck or I'm going through certain seasons of different things. That's life. That doesn't mean I'm still not worthy to claim it or dream about it or pursue it. Corey, we've come to the part of our interview. It's called Fun Facts Lightning Round. I'm going to ask you a series of questions and I'd like you to give me very quick answers. If there's something you desire not to answer, feel free to say pass. Are you ready for the fun facts lightning round? Let's go. What is your favorite comfort food? Chocolate brownies. The last movie you saw? Creed 3. Your ideal car? Jeep Grand Cherokee SRT. You relax doing what? Playing Fortnite with my nephew. What food you eat every week, no matter what? Baked chicken and pizza. So protein and a little guilt trip. <laughs> Work out or hit the couch? Both. Work out and then you'll be exhausted to hit the couch. <laughs> Troy, thank you so much for joining us on Black Entrepreneur Experience Podcast. Before we let you go, share with our audience the best way for them to connect with you and to do business with you and leave all your social media handles. Well, the great thing about having a strong personal brand is that if you type in Find Troy on the internet, I come up everywhere. Find Troy is my handle on all social media channels, YouTube, my website. It's all integrated. The best way to connect with me, though, is to send me a direct message noting some information, whether that's being on LinkedIn or Twitter, which are my most dominant channels. And I work with startups, B2B SaaS, and entrepreneurs, helping them grow and scale their business. My specialty is literally building the roadmap and giving you the instructions and the marketing blueprint to help you scale together. Now, I don't do the work for you, but I'll be there right next to you every step of the way, making sure we get these results. Otherwise, I don't get paid. So that is the goal of how it works. I'm very grateful to be in this moment. And I'm very and thankful that you've asked me to be on this podcast experience. And I hope that the listeners and watchers find this as very valuable as I did as a partaker of this moment. Thank you, Troy. That's a wrap.
Thank you for listening and subscribing to Black Entrepreneur Experience. We would love for you to leave a review and rating on iTunes and share with your friends. For show notes and more episodes, go to www.beepodcast.com. Join us next Wednesday. And remember, green is the new black. So keep your bank accounts and your business in the black.